With this amazingly simple training aid made by Finesse, I believe I can literally teach anyone how to swim smooth and cut minutes off their open water swim time specifically. Let's find out how in today's third instalment of the Swim Smooth Stroke Correction Hierarchy. Thanks so much for the massive response we've had to the last two videos as I aim to demonstrate the Swim Smooth Stroke Correction Hierarchy to help you or your coach simplify your approach to swimming with the best possible technique for you personally. A little bit more on that later. We've had three times as many people watch episode two as watched episode one in this new five part series and each have totally eclipsed our watch, comments, and engage rate of all prior Swim Smooth videos, including Mr. Smooth himself. Sorry, Jono. Aww. Ian Lovegrove, who is 78 and still loving his long distance swimming in the Lake District in the UK, sent me this note this week. My main point in writing is to thank you from the bottom of my heart for making this latest series so widely available. He also added, I understand business and know you will have your profit margins to consider so I know it must have been a conscious decision to post the series as you have, but I just wanted to let you know that in what can sometimes be an overly focused commercial world, your gesture is very much appreciated. Thanks Ian. Funnily enough, this is precisely why I'm taking the time to put this new series of videos out there to return to our core values of providing no nonsense quality swim coaching for everyone. Whilst this mission nearly got derailed by others for a point back there, through my fight to protect the same values and ethos I used to create Swim Smooth back in 2004, I hope to help democratize access to my methodology to continue helping swimmers like Ian and you. So I just wanted to say a sincere thank you if you're watching these series of videos for your support, encouragement and questions. They're all very much appreciated and I see it as my privilege to be able to help you all. I began the series questioning the validity of some of the acronyms often used in swimming parlance. SWOLF is a metric used by coaches and devices to supposedly give you a gauge of your efficiency when looking at time taken to complete each length of the pool coupled with your stroke count. Blagged, still not getting any better at saying that, is a stroke correction hierarchy of sorts used but extensively by governing bodies the world over which features breathing as the fourth out of five most important aspects for your consideration. Look, I don't mind going against the grain here and saying that I don't believe either of these two acronyms are gonna help you with your swimming. You can artificially improve your swolf score just by gliding more and kicking harder to take fewer strokes per lap, but this certainly isn't efficient swimming. As we'll see in the final video of our five part series, and leaving breathing as the fourth thing you should consider for your swimming development, well, frankly, that's just wrong. That said, David Kaufman left a poignant comment in last week's video. He said, I was expecting you to ask us to comment about what we think the next step would be in the acronym of things to work on when swimming freestyle. So far, we have B and D. I would say eliminating movements that can potentially injure you, which would include a thumb first entry into the water, crossing over the midline, not rotating, etc. Well, firstly, B and D doesn't sound like the start of a very easy to remember acronym, does it? But that's really the point here. We're not trying to create something that sounds interesting or cool like SWOLF, but moreover, give you the blueprint to help you correct your stroke. Or if you are a coach yourself, help others improve their swimming. If that leaves us with a series of consonants reminiscent of a vowelless village in North Wales, then so be it. Secondly, David is of course correct. This week's third stage in our Swim Smooth Stroke Correction hierarchy will focus on A for alignment which covers off a large magnitude of aspects of the freestyle stroke, including one, how far forwards in front of your head your hand enters into the water, two, your hand alignment as you enter into the water, three, the hand depth as you extend forwards in the water, and four, the lateral positioning of your hand and arm as you extend forwards in the water. And most importantly, effect that any issues with these aspects of your alignment have on other areas of your stroke, vis-a-vis, Welcome to our cause and effect aspect of our methodology. Alignment can really be thought of as anything that will help you set up for a better stroke, especially the catch, as we'll discuss next week. These four aspects of your alignment can all be brought together with a drill I designed specifically for this way back in 2013, which I named the javelin drill on account of how it looks in the water. 
The drill progression starts with simply kicking on your side, which is a great way of testing your stability and alignment in its raw form. If you can improve on this simple aspect, your swimming will improve in leaps and bounds, no matter what your ability level or the core issue facing your stroke. We'll look more closely at the full javelin drill in just a moment. But first, if you are a coach, or even if you're just interested in becoming a coach or simply to help others improve their swimming, why not check out the links on your screen to help you either learn with us remotely with a new course I've put together on how to do video analysis and stroke correction, or consider joining me personally for our three-day coach education course in Montenegro on the 3rd to the 5th of October. It's a great opportunity in an absolutely wonderful part of the world, and I'd love to see you there. Okay, so let's consider the four main aspects to your alignment in the water, which can be summed up as, one, your hand reach, two, your hand entry, three, your hand depth, and four, the hand direction of travel. These four aspects take place almost simultaneously within the stroke during your hand entry and extension phase. So when I'm analyzing a swimmer's stroke, I'm really running through a checklist of these points and grading the swimmer as to how much of an issue these areas are for them. Sometimes I won't mention one, two, three, or even all four of these aspects of their stroke as, in my opinion, solid coaching is about knowing what faults to look for in a swimmer's stroke. Good coaching is about knowing where to start and what to correct, but great coaching is as much about knowing what to leave out of this discussion as opposed to what to include. Many people make out swimming to be some form of rocket science, but really it's not that at all. Yes, there are lots of aspects to the stroke. We're breaking down this course right now as per our stroke correction hierarchy, but being able to simplify that process is what it's all about ultimately. Watching YouTube videos on how to improve your swimming, and yes, I realize the irony there, including this series too, runs the significant risk that you go away and over-process the information and actually do yourself a disservice because of this. So please remember these five critical things for me before I show you how to correct your own alignment in the water. One, only work on one thing at a time. Two, being 80% perfect with your execution of the stroke will leave you far more relaxed and fluid than trying to be 110% perfect all the time. Three, there is no such thing as a perfect stroke. Four, what works well for you could be completely different to what works well for somebody else. And five, ultimately having a qualified coach like our brilliant Swim Smooth coaches help you identify what you actually need to work on yourself is always going to be way more beneficial than watching YouTube video clips, this one included. So let's look at the hand reach. Many people get taught to enter into the water by reaching as far forward as possible but this usually sees the elbow enter into the water before the hand, leading to a dropped elbow position, which compromises the catch. Equally, some people are taught to enter so close to the head and then extend and glide forwards underneath the water that this usually leads to a significant risk of overgliding and deceleration. We'll go over the negative impact of gliding in parts four and five of this stroke correction hierarchy series in a little bit more depth, but ultimately you want to be entering into the water at a distance in front of the head where the fingertips are able to enter before the wrist and the wrist before the elbow. Let's take a quick look at Brett's analysis from last night as we identify his overreaching issue and then look at how to correct it using a very simple single arm drill. Yeah. If you look at it here, like, this is what I was really seeing though, was how that left elbow yeah, yeah. is striking before the left hand. Yeah. So the nice thing with, I've just literally upgraded to this uh, new GoPro here. It goes very, very nicely at 120 frames per second. We can make this slow motion super glassy and smooth. You can even see on that right yeah, side, yeah, the right, yeah. but that really very much so here, look on the left. So there's a couple of things here. You could say, well, why don't I just think about keeping my elbow higher? But the reason the elbow is down low here is because we're stretching out a little bit too far and the elbow is like in that position. So yeah. if you were to enter into the water slightly earlier and we need to really refine the thought process in our head, I'm not gonna be asking you to enter into the water and feel like you're entering shorter or shortening up the stroke. We're just gonna enter into the water earlier. And you could say, well, aren't those two things exactly the same, short, shorter and earlier? 
the important point here is that by entering earlier, I'm still going to be encouraging you to extend forwards. But when we extend forwards, we're underneath, underneath the water, water and the okay. fingertips are deeper than the wrist and the wrist is deeper than the elbow there. So the key thing on this left arm is enter at the wrist. Here we go. Good. Lengthen it under. Good. Well done, very good. Distance in front of the head, perfect. Yep. But now let's just try and get that little bit of extension beyond the lead arm, yeah, underneath the water. Yeah. So long as we don't do this, so we don't want to go in and then go scoop up. We just want to go in and feel like we're reaching beyond this arm, beyond the outstretched arm. Okay, here we go. Bingo, well done, well done. Okay, so what we're gonna do now, if you grab that pointy paddle, doesn't matter which one you grab, we're going to now kick on your left side, shoulder blades together and back with that left hand extended out in front of you. We're gonna kick for about 15 meters or so, Brett. When you see me going like this, I want you to start to swim free start to the end. Now, this is your cue to then only breathe towards me. So this entire lap, you're breathing towards me over here. This left hand, all I want you to think in your head is I don't want you to think the stroke is shorter, I want you to think it's earlier. Yep. By about that much, four or five Stop centimeters. Very subtle, yeah. You're, I see people overreaching and doing this all the time, and you're not one of those people. You've got a slight overreach, but it's not massive. Subtlety is going to be key here. Okay, side kicking first. Yep. Okay. Good, good, much better. Just before we move on, check out this video of double Olympic gold medalist Rebecca Adlington's hand entry into the water. Now, here's a little insider secret. When performing a video analysis session with a swimmer, I'll almost always show Becky's stroke as a prime example of what to do. And we'll see more of her in part four and part five of this series. However, check out her left hand entry. It's perfect. It's the perfect distance in front of her head, creating a little window underneath her elbow as she enters into the water, fingertips before wrist and the wrist before the elbow. Just like I was working on there with Brett. But now look at her right arm. It overreaches and enters elbow first, going to show that even a world record holder can have issues in their strokes. Pretty amazing, right? Now let's look at the actual hand entry. I mentioned my wife, Michelle, in the last video. She's an excellent physiotherapist who specializes in the shoulders of swimmers. The running joke is that we have a great family business. I injure everyone, and then she goes on and fixes them. Joking aside, of course, though, you need to avoid entering into the water thumbs first. Try it now. Sit up tall, arms outstretched with your shoulders in a neutral position, palm of the hand looking down. Now turn your thumbs down so your shoulders are internally rotated. Feel that awkwardness on your shoulder? Now imagine doing that 3,000 times in an hour's swimming session. And there's no wonder why statistics show that over 80% of all adult swimmers will succumb to shoulder injury within their swimming life at some point, especially when a thumb first entry is still being taught in many parts of the world. Conversely, someone pointed me to a website ages ago where right at the top of its homepage had a quote about me telling you to avoid thumb first entry into the water, especially because of the risk of injury as an aging swimmer. So instead they recommended the exact opposite and called their entire program thumbs up swimming instead. Whilst this external rotation of the shoulder helps avoid pain, it also increases slippage during the catch phase, which we'll look at more in part four of this video series. Every aspect of the freestyle stroke occurs along a spectrum or a continuum. Thus, it's possible to be either too long or too short, to kick too hard or too little, to stroke too fast or too slow. The magic usually lies at a sweet spot of neutrality somewhere in the middle. But even then, this point is different for everyone. Now let's look at hand depth. 
I've already mentioned a few examples of swimming parlance that I just do not like at all. Glide, to me, is a dirty word. We'll discuss why in part five. High elbows are a relative term, and distance per stroke, or DPS, is often sought in completely the wrong way. So many people place such a heavy emphasis on the length of their stroke, gliding more in the belief that they're increasing their DPS, without realizing that as they stretch forwards, the depth of the hand often reaches up towards the surface of the water, making it impossible to keep your elbow high. This massively affects the ability to catch the water well. More in part four. Let's look at the world's best ever swimmer now, Michael Phelps. He's massively tall, long levers, big hands, big feet, the veritable picture of perfection when it comes to a swimmer's body. He can swim lengths of a 50 meter pool in around about 20 or 22 strokes. So he glides a lot within his stroke, right? Wrong. Michael Phelps achieves true distance per stroke by simply ensuring that whenever his hands are in the water, he's always pressing water back behind him. That's what gives him true distance per stroke. Or at least not doing anything that would cause the opposite of this by putting the brakes on or pushing down on the water. This sends him forward and helps him keep his body position high as well. He purposefully spears deeper in the water than many of you would think. If you drew a 180 degree arc on his stroke from this side position, most people would think it would make sense to start the catch at zero degrees and work all the way back to 180 degrees. But Phelps doesn't do this. He spears deeper, allowing himself to have the best biomechanical position to be able to press water back behind him. This gives the appearance of a high elbow catch, but as compared to this swimmer of mere mortal standards, Phelps' elbow is no higher than theirs relative to the surface of the water. It just looks higher because his fingertips are deeper at full extension. If you watch him here, he's a tall guy, right? Yes. Massive wingspan, huge hands, big feet. He travels a long way on each stroke. Coaches refer to this as DPS or distance per stroke. Okay. But I want you to watch how Michael Phelps achieves true distance per stroke, completely the opposite way to you're trying to achieve it yourself. Okay. okay. So let's just draw on that line again there, look. You see the surface of the water there. Yes. But notice how whenever he reaches into the water, see how he always reaches to that deeper position there? Yes. Just stays the same point every single every time. Every like single. The same point with exactly. Both, both now, ends. you would think that the world's best swimmer, if it was true that we've got to start at zero and work to 180, you would think that the world's best swimmer would do that. Yes. But he doesn't. He, he doesn't. ignores that. He actually does what your left hand is doing. You're doing what Michael Phelps is doing with your left arm, left arm. really well, actually. Yeah. Just not on the right hand side. Just not on the right hand yeah, side. Yeah, yeah. So the reason this is developed like this over time is two reasons really. One is, you know, we've been trying to make sure the stroke is long as we can, but the primary reason is because of the focus on just breathing to that left hand side. Left hand side. And then okay. we use that arm like a lever to lift ourselves up. So whilst we'll properly get into the catch phase of the stroke in part four, oops, I gave the game away for stage four of the swim smooth stroke correction hierarchy, didn't I? Getting your alignment right first with regards to the depth of the hand at full extension is absolutely critical for you to have a good catch in the first place. Now let's look at the hand direction of travel. So finally, we get into what most people consider as alignment. Whether or not you're crossing over in front of your head or equally entering too wide, remember the spectrum here. The direction of travel that your hand takes into the water and whether it goes straight forwards across in front of your head or out wide will have a massive impact on your ability to channel your energies to send you forward as efficiently as possible, help avoid shoulder injury and equally help you swim a lot straighter in the open water if that is what you want to do. And you should swim straighter and swim in the open water that is. Let's take a look at Jono, Mr. Smooth from a bird's eye view. It's like he's swimming on two rails around about 30 centimeters apart. Really, his middle finger is extending straight forwards in front of the respective shoulder to keep him dead straight. When viewed now from the front like this, he actually looks so perfect that many people think this video is animated. It's not, but of course we animated Mr. Smooth based off Jono himself. Pretty cool, right? Crossing over causes your body to snake down the pool like we see Ian doing here. Interestingly, he does this much more when he goes to take a breath in. 
Look at how he deviates significantly off course when he does so, which is again why breathing simply has to be the first stage in the stroke correction hierarchy. If we now take a quick look at the session that I did with Ian to correct this last week, we'll see why the Finis alignment kickboard is so useful in starting this process of correction and how we can build from there to the full javelin drill exercise. Just before I run this, stay tuned to the end of the sequence as I'll answer this very relevant query from David Kaufman that I received earlier on this week. In your book, says David, you recommend pressing the shoulder blades together and down to improve posture in the water. But when I look at great swimmers like Rebecca Addington, don't they shrug their shoulders to get their cheek against their upper arm or armpit? Shrugging your shoulders is the exact opposite of pressing the shoulder blades down. So I'm confused. Sorry, David. Also, won't pressing your shoulder blades down actually shorten your extension? So let's take a final look at David's query on the protraction or retraction of the shoulder. Everything I've mentioned in that last clip with Ian talks about retracting the shoulder, not protracting it and popping the shoulder towards the cheek. Do elite swimmers do this? Yes, some do. What's the difference between you and an elite swimmer? One of the key things is both flexibility and stability of the shoulder joint they will have much better levels of both than you or I. So consequently can take things to a greater range of movement. This doesn't preclude them from injury risk of both extreme protraction and in some cases significant internal rotation of the shoulder, but it certainly helps. As to whether retracting the shoulder, specifically drawing the shoulder blades together and back, causes you to shorten your extension, take one last look at Ian doing this exercise and ask yourself whether or not he looks better doing so than when he was just snaking down the pool. Okay, so let's try it the other way around now. So paddle on the right hand, and we'll do this up against the lane rope. This might give you a little bit of claustrophobia here on this side, because if you do start to drift, you're gonna be bumping in towards that lane right there. Okay, right hand forwards, here we go. Shoulder blades together and back. Just take that right hand slightly deeper in the water. There you go, that's perfect, perfect position. Very good. Draw your left shoulder back towards me a little bit more. That's it. Excellent. Just have a go just looking straight down so you're not straining your neck too much. So just look straight down rather than, there we go, that's better. That's better. Good, there you go, good. Excellent. That's perfect. Okay, pause it there. So again, that one was really good. Just the last one, we get to the end and it just drifts slightly there. Okay, one more time then before we get rid of the kickboard, still with the paddle on that right hand. <clears throat> so still breathing towards me. This is your favorite side here. Okay, nice and close to the wall. Use it as a claustrophobia effect, not to bump into it. So shoulder blades together and back. That's really good there, Ian. So we're just using that wall there as a little bit of a gauge. The last thing you want to do is bump into it. So you've got to really think about keeping that posture set. Excellent, mate. Excellent. Very good. Bingo. Very nice. Okay. So just relax that right hand down by your side. That's better. Good. Okay. Now, remember, I only want you to breathe towards me every four strokes. Let's go freestyle to the end. See if you can keep yourself straighter than normal. And straight. Good, so just notice that little deviation towards, that's a better one, much better, mate, much better. Run that left hand down that black line. That is much better, Ian. Oh! Apart from the, apart from the slight bingle there. <laughs> now, interesting enough, the first, you hopefully you could feel it, the first time you breathe to the right, you did drift off the black line there. But every other one, after you had that sort of bit of reinforcement, yeah. much straighter. Absolutely, keep it in line. Yeah, keep it in line, yeah. So new stroke to begin with, breathing every four strokes and straight. Good. Excellent. Just breathe a fraction earlier. Good. Nice one. All right, back to the old stroke now. So keep going, but thumbs first. And the line, there, feel that, wow. The whole body is literally snaking around in the water. 
You're about to spear a duck here as well if you get lucky. <laughs> I'll just add one final tip to this issue of crossing over and snaking down the pool. Personally, I do not like the instruction of getting the swimmer to enter at 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock to try to overcorrect for that crossover. Yes, it can work in some extreme scenarios, but what I often find is that the next time I'd see the swimmer, they'd simply be entering way, way too wide. And that can cause just as many problems by entering wide as crossing over in front of the head there as well. So I'd much prefer for the swimmer to try to find that neutral position. And that is why the javelin drill is so effective. It simply allows you to point your middle finger down the pool using the Finney's Freestyler paddle as your gauge and your cue such that if you are crossing over or going out wide, the paddle will fall off your hand. And by getting you to wear that paddle on the left hand whilst you breathe to the right, or the right hand whilst you breathe to the left, is a really, really good way of making sure that you are totally focused on the point within the stroke, like with Ian, where the hand would deviate across in front of the head whilst you're going to take a breath in. Let's take a look then, finally, at the javelin drill as a full sequence. Give it a try this week and let us know how you get on. Thanks for watching and see you for part four next week. Let us know in the comments below your stories about how straight or not you are when you swim in the open water. I'd love to hear them and I'll get right back to you. Thanks again, catch you next week.